Welcome. If you would like to help out as a worship servant, please sign up with a clipboard. Um, we will always need volunteers. Um, Bishop Laura Merrill was elected to lead the two Oklahoma conferences of the United Methodist Church this week. She will add that to her uh, job as the Arkansas uh, annual conference. So she'll have all three. Um, information on the new um, bishop is going to be in the narthex. Uh, prayer team will start meeting on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. in the parlor beginning July 16. Those of you who are missing the daily devotional guides, the upper room, the July, August issue should be here next week sometime. August is Invitational Month, and August 6th is Family Sunday. Invite your family to worship together in unity for this church. August 11th is Friends and Neighbors Sunday. Then on August 13th, we have Back to School Teacher Appreciation, where we will be cooking the meal here and serving at the school. Um, a sign-up sheet will be in the narthex next week. August 15th is a prayer vigil. August 18th is Back to School Sunday. And August 25th is Celebration Sunday. Stay tuned for more details. Did you talk about next Wednesday? No? Okay. So this Wednesday, you want to cover that? I can't. Sure. Okay. Uh, Wednesday, we got several things going on. Uh, the choir is going to be at 5:30. Those choir members out there. Um, at six o'clock. Six o'clock. Right. We need to have a church council meeting at six to discuss some uh, building items. We need to uh, make a decision on and a couple other things. So please, if you're on the church council, Tanya, if you're on it, uh, we need to we need to be there. I forget if it's you or David, whichever. Anyway, I know Nikki's on it. Those of you that are on it, we need to meet Wednesday at 6 p.m. and then at 7 p.m. We're going to have another program that as many people as can be there need to be there. I'm going to let you go. So. Um, that we were going to start last Wednesday had two attendees. And I need as many of you to come. And maybe I didn't make that uh, clear. I sent it as an invitation. <clears throat> but I made an invitation. I really want you to come. We all need to be together as we begin to work to go forward <clears throat> and to really think about the idea of what it is for this church to thrive. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to get some scriptures and talk about what God's asking us to do, as He's telling us to do. Um, and we're going to have some more discussions. In addition, we're going to have some flat food. And what that means from an old tech guy uh, that worked for me is that means it's pizza. There's going to be some pizza there. Come grab a slice or two and be part of our conversation. And that includes those who come for the meeting. We'll be there for the admin. We'll have the flat food pizza for the meeting. So come and just, it'll be casual, but I think you'll find it to be very important as we, as we truly regenerate, regenerate, renew the roots of this church and begin to grow anew. So I will see, I want to see all of you at seven on Wednesday. Okay, and so, let's go ahead and have a opening video. going to move on and begin worship this morning as we prepare our hearts. Let us stand together and we are going to sing this first song, this opening hymn. Very short. And we're going to sing an a cappella. So if you would stand and join with me. Come now is the time to worship. It's in the 
It's in the worship and song book. Blessed be the God and parent of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank God for every spiritual blessing. May the glory of God be known in this place. May God's peace dwell in this and every day. Who shall ascend the hill to reach for God? Who shall stand in God's holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts. Those who are not false or deceived. God speaks peace to those who are faithful. Lift up your heads and your hearts to God. We have come to hear the word of truth. We turn to God, eager to receive salvation. If you join with me, we will share together our invocation of prayer. It is in the bulletin that will be on the screen. Let's say it now together. Our God, our Father. We thank you that today you have called us to worship you and to learn of you. You all know our needs. Satisfy them with your unchanging love. In your presence, may we find comfort and sorrow, guidance and perplexity, strength to meet temptation, grace to overcome the fascination of disobedience and courage to face up to the hostility of this rebellious world. Above all, may we meet Jesus and go out from our worship and dwell by his spirit. This prayer we ask to your glory and in his name, amen. And if you remain standing, we will turn to page 881 in the hymnal. It is also on the, on the screen as we share together in the Apostles' Creed. This is an ancient text that goes back to the early days of our Christian faith. And we remember this text because it defines who we are as Christians and connects us with all Christians around the world. Let's say it together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Unless you want to stand in the Lord, Father.
We turn now to a time of prayer. We begin with our hymn of prayer, We Will Love to Thee. We sing the first verse, and then as the music continues, I invite you to silent prayer and meditation. Gracious, wonderful God, we come at this time to worship you, to give praise to you. We also come with our hearts that are containing things upon which we worry, stress, our challenges. We lift them up to you and ask that you know what is in our heart, that you give us peace, comfort, guidance, and wisdom. We may we always, always turn, turn to, to you, you for our strength, strength, for our hope, and for the truth. Lord, Lord God, we lift up to you the challenges that are here, here in this world. We lift up to you those leaders, leaders around the nations and ask to give them your wisdom, give guidance, guidance to this world, to ways that they may make decisions that lift the people up and reduce poverty and injustice. Lord God, we ask that you turn down the temperatures of our own internal and national debates, and we remove the desire to kill our enemies and those who we oppose our people. Let us always be and move in peace and care for one another, seeking you as the guidance of our lives. And when we cannot find the words to say, when we're simply overwhelmed with our life and world and challenges, let us always remember the prayer that your son taught us as we say it now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Yes, us please come forward to gather our minds. Lord God, we ask that you give us inspiration, that you give us hope to see the future.
our sovereignty. Show it to you Wednesday night, but really, it, it, so thinking about all the different reasons why people do not come to church today. They're too busy, or maybe they're going to leave, they're, they're sensitive, maybe they're lonely, it's not, not good enough. Maybe they the walls of the building are too tall, you feel like a castle, and the land, land around it, and the moon. You think about that, it just, when the time so much different than it was, we all went all the time. Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. 
in him you also, when you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed in him, marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's only people, to the praise of his glory. Do you have the flash drive? What? Pastor Allen, do you have the flash drive? Do you have the flash drive? Okay. I don't have any video. They're not any of them here. Sorry. Okay. All right. Well, uh, the new movie. Oh, sorry. I am sorry. I get it. Our gospel text this morning comes from the book of Mark. We begin to chapter 6, read 14 through 19. He cared further. What he heard of was about Jesus and his disciples' healing. He cared and heard of that, and for Jesus' name had become known. John the baptizer had been raised from the dead, he said. And for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the old prophets. But when Herod heard of, of it, he said, John, referring to John the Baptist, whom I beheaded and been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of his wife, Herodias. His brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herod has had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and so he had protected him. But when he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and he liked to listen to John. But an opportunity came for him when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests, said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish, I will give it. And he swore to her, whatever you ask, I will give you even half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? And she replied, the head of John the Baptist. And immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once, the head of John the Baptist on a flag. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he didn't want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison. He brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. The girl then gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard about this, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. 
blah, blah, blah. Am I really a polar bear? Yes. Are you a polar bear? Yes. And then you go out and play and see his dad catching fish and things. Yes. Dad, are you a polar bear? Yes, of course I'm a polar bear. Am I a polar bear? Of course. Your mother and I are polar bears, and you're our child. You're a polar bear. This kept going for days for a while, and finally one evening the mother and the father said to the little cub, why do you keep asking this? We tell you you are a polar bear. You're a beautiful polar bear cub. Why do you worry? He said, because I'm cold. Sometimes, even in our Christian faith, we get out into the cold. We think we're on a path, we think we're in the house, doing what we're supposed to do, but sometimes it gets a little cold. Maybe, maybe it's because the choices we made have left us out, or maybe it's become the action of someone else that makes us feel cold. But we need to know and be confident in the fact that as children of God, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, we are indeed warm women in our hearts. So as you contemplate this message this morning, I want you to be thinking about those times when you have been out in the cold, and those times when you come in from the cold and feel that warmth. And then to think a little bit about what it is to have that spirit of God inside you always warming your soul. That's great. Lord, maker of all things, friend to all of us through your Son, Jesus Christ, who sent as our Redeemer, as our Savior. By the glorious resurrection of your Son, you have vanquished the powers of death that once held our lives. We acknowledge that you choose us before we choose you. We reached out to us, you have, and called us by our names, and you have sent us to do your work in the world. Give us the gifts and the seed that are our lives may bear fruit in your name. To tell others about what your love has meant to us and is doing within us. And above all, help us to love one another as you have loved us. Lord God, I ask that you give meaning and purpose to the words that I share this morning, that they set the hearts of your children on fire. Our text comes this morning, our message comes from the text that we've read out of Mark and out of Ephesians. So let me help set the table a little bit more. Deb and I went to a church shortly after we came to Oklahoma. Before I had changed career, before I went into ministry, and, and this pastor would say and begin his service, "Good morning, saints." I've said that a few times. Good, good morning, saints, and then we would respond, "Good morning, saints," and then he would say, "Good morning, sinners." <laughs> the congregation that was there before we came were comfortable in saying, "Good morning, sinners," but I did not find that comforting. I did not like to say, good morning, sinners. I'm a sinner. And I observed over the next few years as others came in and visited that there was a struggle, a conflict about what it was to proclaim myself as a sinner. You know, most of us try very hard to live life without committing sin. There's a theologian named Brown that, that said it very clearly, we all try hard. We can't avoid sin we can avoid it most of the time, most of us do, but we can't avoid it all of the time. We can't avoid all of the sins. That puts us in this quandary of having to acknowledge and admit that we are indeed a sinner, that we have indeed failed and gotten things wrong. Now, let's think about this a bit. Sometimes this gets a little confusing about what sinning is. And I don't want to try and simplify it. And I will come to the Ten Commandments. The first four are very clear. Loving God with all that we have, our heart, mind, and soul. That sounds easy to say, I love God, until you get somewhere in the middle of a problem or a challenge, 
and you begin to think about what your needs and purposes are without thinking about what it is to, to praise God and love God and all that we have. If God's the priority, have we really thought through that decision? So, simplistically, it says anything seems to be anything that gets in between you and God, that separates you from God. Think about that for a minute. What does separate us from God? Well, sometimes the things we do to others separates us from God. Sometimes the challenges that we face that we struggle with separates from God. We begin to wonder, why did God do this? Why did God spin the wheel? I remember being in a youth and sitting in a conversation and the discussion was, was do you think life is like a big, big roulette wheel and you spin it and wherever the ball lands, wherever the dart hits, that's going to be your reality. That's your faith. And that kind of puts it in the case of that God every day is throwing, spinning the wheel and throwing millions of darts or see who lands and what's going to happen to you and I each day. Is that something that, that you buy into? Is that kind of what reality is? That it's already going to be set, baby. God's already written it down in a book, put it away, and you're going to live exactly as it's been predestined. You have no choice. Or is there something else that gets away? Maybe, maybe the choices we're making that we're not really thinking about get in the way. The second Round the remaining six temptations about how we treat other people. We hurt them, we do things to, to take from them. Somehow, failing in those six makes it very hard to be saying, I'm living and praising God and making Him first in my life, first in all my choices. There's a, there's a conflict, or it can be a conflict, if we don't stop and take the time and think through our choices. Sometimes we react and respond. We think we're doing the right thing. We're making decisions. It's going to go to somebody, somewhere, something comes along and changes it. Now we're thinking about now what we're going to do. Take that two steps back. We're thinking about how we're going to go forward again. And maybe in that process, we get angry. We get hateful. We, get, we decide we want to do something different. We find ourselves in the quandary of forgetting God and our love for God must the first and most important thing that we do. That's our story, really, from the book of Mark. Is he's telling us a story about Herod. Now, let me give you some background, because Herod also gets a little bit confused. We have King Herod, the great, at the time of Jesus' birth. And that King Herod was ruthless. He was hard driven. He built many palaces and fortresses, he taxed his people heavy, but he was closely connected with Emperor Julius Caesar. Caesar had his back. And so he got away with a lot. Now, that Herod the Great was not a Jew. He was king of the Jews, but he was not Jewish. His wife was Jewish, but he was not. He did things to honor the Jewish people only because he felt that was essential. He did upgrade substantially the second temple and finish the temple under his leadership. Many other things he did were not so good. Before he died, he left a testament, what we would call a will today, that declared that his two sons, Antipas and Philip, would divide the kingdoms. One would have the south and one would have the north. And Antipas was the one in the south. He had Galilee and Jerusalem, and those areas were part of his kingdom. That's why we hear in this story, Antipas here, Herod Antipas, was the king at this time. Two different Herods, two different kings, periods. John, of course, was outspoken, directly to the point. He didn't beat around the bush. He wanted people to know clearly that they needed to prepare their way for the price that was coming. They needed to repent of their sins. They needed to change their life. And doing so, they're ready to begin to accept that they would hear Jesus. Now, Mark writes this a little bit of a confusing way because 
He tells of Herod hearing about what is going on by Jesus, and people are not sure who this Jesus really is. Is it one of the old prophets? Is it Elijah having come back? Or is it John the Baptist? And that was Herod's conclusion that it had to be John resurrected and has come back and is doing these miracles. Because he knew for a fact he had his soldiers arrest him and take his head. Then Mark goes on to tell us the details of the story. And interestingly, it's Herod had been a protector of John the Baptist because he respected, he liked what he had to say, except for one thing. Jesus called out the sinfulness of Herod. And Jesus especially challenged Herod when Herod married his brother's wife, Herodias. And so you have this story about the daughter tempting this Herod for her, her uh, exotic dancing and how he pleaded. You know, Herod loved to be the center of attention. And he loved the people coming to be around him and, and doing things with him. He loved to throw lavish parties of all types and natures of parties. And so here he was amongst his friends, among people he wants to impress. And he makes this ludicrous promise that he would do something because he was so pleased with the dancing and performance. So the question is, would you take someone's life when you're in the middle of a conflict or when you're in a challenge? If somebody, you made such a promise to do something, how committed are you to actually doing that? Are you really willing to carry through and act because you promised it, even if you know, know it's not the right thing to do? Are you, are you willing, willing to harm or hurt others in order, order to protect your name and reputation? To avoid social, social challenge, challenge, be uncomfortable, maybe, maybe even to have a time or argument in the dispute with your own spouse or close friends. Are you willing to make those choices? Or are you so committed to move forward regardless of the harm? And that's just a conflict that here no one had experienced. No, I would want to take time. time. Because I had a 
had that bad experience, and I'm losing and stepping back away from Christ. I'm stepping back another step further away from God. Sure, we're going to have problems and challenges and difficulties, but if God remains at the center of what we're doing, if God remains our focus, love and praise God, wouldn't that be a way to keep learning and growing and figuring out new ways? The way. so next time I was asked, well, after a couple of times I turned people down, because my heart did harden a little bit, then I had a first person came to me and I said, I'll teach you how to cast it. I pulled out my heart that was running in the home and allowed them to fill it up. I gave them a few extra dollars, dollars and they could get to the bar, and then they could go in and get a few bottles of soda and a few things to snack on. It makes a difference. We have to just learn and grow. That can be for three years. That first person that that people I trusted, they can just try again, teaching you to help others, to help those who can, one of those who can help. Be a 
gets foul of God, we find and discover that warmth within us. And we are able to move and find and share warmth of others. That gives the love and grace that we've given to us without asking. We've given to us before we were born. Christ of the Lord, in the last of his day, will all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and him.
begin to invite you to come home to you. The Friday could be meaningful and uplifting for all of your conversation about the future, the steps we will take to make that future world cry for a long time now. Let us stand and prepare to share in our closing. Okay, turn me on. Lead out the funny video.